Well, thank you very much for the uh, welcome and the uh, hospitality. Uh, aloha. We, we had a Hawaiian-themed lunch with pineapple and pepperoni pizza. <laughs> so uh, I felt very much uh, quickly acclimated. Anyway, what I'd like to do today for the next hour or so is, is uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> a rather remarkable series of eruptions that went on last year uh, at Kilauea on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, they were remarkable in at least two different ways. <clears throat> they were, and the eruptions were located in two different places. One was the so-called summit area, immediately overlying the magma reservoir, the active magma uh, transport system ascending from the mantle. Uh, and one was uh, very active and very uh, uniquely powerful in what's called the Lower East Rift Zone. Uh, Kilauea, like most other Hawaiian shield volcanoes, is cut or bisected by a great crack or a series of cracks. These cracks have depth extents down to 10 kilometers. Uh, they form what are referred to as the Hawaiian Volcanic Rift Zones. The East Rift Zone, for example, starts out at the summit and progresses about 40 to 45 kilometers to the East Cape. And then it dives beneath the ocean surface and continues along until its ultimate lateral reach is about 100 kilometers. So these are very sizable uh, fracture zones. Uh, again, extending 10 kilometers by 100 kilometers. You can see that that is quite fundamental. <coughs> This is what things looked like on June 6th of last year in the summit area of Kilauea. This is the so-called Halimaumau pit crater, which at that time was on the order of a kilometer to a kilometer and a half in diameter. This is taken from about four kilometers distance. <clears throat> and we see a phreatic eruption rising with rock dust, juvenile material, gas, and occasional lava bombs, which reached two meters or so in diameter. And this kind of thing went on for uh, quite some time, some 60 cycles of this uh, over the next 60 days or so. Here is Kilauea caldera in a very enlarged state. Uh, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is over in about this position. This was taken from more or less the same vantage point as the slide earlier, so you can see how radically things got in terms of caldera enlargement and, deepen and deepening. This is one week's worth of seismicity uh, from the 24th of July through the end of that month, and it's divided up into a number of things. Uh, the, the earthquake, uh, the symbol diameter scales with the earthquake magnitude. Uh, and so you see this periodicity of large magnitude 5 to 5.5 earthquakes that occurred with an actual uh, span of 6 hours to 68 hours, but it tended to settle down on 28 hours as a preferred time interval. All of this is confined to the upper 10 kilometers virtually. This is depth in color charts. Uh, and it turns out that 10 kilometers is the bottom of the volcanic stack, the bottom of the volcanic shield. At 10 kilometers and just below, you're moving into the oceanic crust. And so the bottom of the oceanic crust would be at about this level. And now you're in upper mantle down to 70 kilometers. And 70 kilometers is about the maximum depth extent at which one can record earthquake activity beneath active Hawaiian volcanoes. But correlating with these large magnitude 5 to 5.5 events was a new class of um, activity referred to as collapse explosion events with a hyphen between the words. They were associated with collapse, major collapse increments of the summit caldera and subsequent explosions. And we'll see in a second how that, how that goes in another context. Some of this was not exactly new. Um, there were certain instances of large-scale phreatic eruptions. This is in May uh, 1924. 
Uh, and this particular photograph was actually taken from about the same vantage point as those earlier two or three slides. So we're looking basically from the east towards the west. This was on May 24th of 1924, and here we see a group of tourists who happened to be holding rooms in the Volcano House Hotel that thought this would be a very opportune time to gather together for a group photograph. Well, it really isn't an opportune time. It's a good time to head the other way, but nevertheless, they, they were intrepid and nobody got hurt until the photographer showed up. And I don't think it was the same one, Tai Sing Lu, who sh shot this particular photograph. It was another photographer, but he was killed when a bomb fell on him uh, further out in the, in the Cold Era area. Here's an example of the immediate surroundings of the Cold Era on what's called Crater Rim Drive. And during normal times, and these are by far and away not normal times, during normal times one can take their their rental car and, or their, their private car and, and tool around about a 12 kilometer circumference around the caldera itself. Here you can see uh, hints of the caldera, little peekaboo views over here, uh, and notice that the sense of displacement here is counterclockwise. We have these blocks moving in this direction and these blocks moving in this direction, rupturing the road surface in an interesting way. In general, the displacement pattern from the cold era during periods of inflation is almost always due south or southwest or a little southeast. But there's kind of a net southerly drift to things. Here is a before and after May 19th, that is to June 13th slide <coughs> or set of comparisons uh, with uh, Halimaumau and Kilauea Crater in its um, pre significant collapse phase with one, in, with one where there's uh, undergoing uh, or has undergone significant collapse in these so-called collapse explosion events. Here's what the deformation profile looked like monitored at a place called Uwekahuna Vault, which is on the northwestern lip, very close to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Uh, we see a kind of a stuttering stick slip motion here that's in detail somewhat curvilinear, bottoming out here. And then there's an explosion event which abruptly resets things to a higher datum, after which things begin to resume the incremental collapse. Now, if you sight along the bottom of these curves, I think you can convince yourself that there's a, a gradual net deepening of things long term. And those are associated with these magnitude 5 to 5.5 earthquakes. Here is a, a somewhat aerial shot, a drone shot, looking into the caldera as it's beginning to collapse, form new deepening elements and so forth, and spread radially. For scale, these are three, I'm going to outline them here, one, two, and three very large bus parking lots. You can fit about 30 or 40 uh, highway tour buses in each one of these three parking lots. This was to bring visitors to the volcanic summit, to let them approach the ledge, look into the caldera and so forth, look into Halimaumau during normal times. On June 11th, the park was closed and I think you can see why it was closed. You, you don't want to be driving, attempting to put a bus in this thing anymore. But here we can see a series of nested concentric down-dropped blocks which collectively make up this telescoping downward moving caldera system. And you can see that, you can almost see the slip line fields, the slip lines themselves as these blocks have moved downward in this fashion. This one, of course, uh, had yet to move further down and then there's more far field elements to this scattered over here. This is the southeast coastline of the island of Hawaii. Um, we're looking at basically a month's worth of seismic data. And these are seismic events in the in and around the summit area of Kilauea, the upper east rift zone, the middle east rift zone, the Pu'u'o'o area, which was active between 1983 and basically 
1990 and beyond. Uh, and then the lower east rift zone here, the eastern cape of the island is here. And it's from this point on into and through the ceiling that the submarine east rift zone extends. It's then called the Puna Ridge, but it's basically one element of the same system. Very, very long, in which dredge, hall, uh, ha dredge halls have revealed uh, highly picritic uh, compositions. On May 4th of 2018, there was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake in about this position, and it had about a 50 centimeter displacement, which is quite, quite large. Since the flow rate of fluids moving through a planar conduit are sensitive to the cube of the conduit width, and inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid moving through it, a little bit of rastering up of the conduit width will get you a lot of extra flow. If you also lower the viscosity of the fluid moving through it, you get yet more flow. And that, both of those things happened during the eruption in 2018. Both those things contributed to the phenomenal, overwhelming distribution of lava flows in the lower east rift zone. This is a kind of a, a, a brief look back in time. Let's, let's go back basically to 1983 and then years following that. This is Pu'u'u'u Crater here in Hawaiian, referred to as the Hill of the Bird. There is an, a, a so-called O'o Bird in Hawaii. And this is the distribution of its lavas. Of course, they went offshore. There's a submarine component to this. And then they wrapped around over here. So, very voluminous flows. They wiped out a subdivision called Royal Gardens uh, with about 125 homes and dwellings disappearing under the lava. They, they then went down to an ocean and ancient Hawaiian fishing community on the coast and wiped that out. But by 1990, this was more or less the distribution of things. And then much, much later, there was this so-called 61G flow, which came down to the coast and was later kind of augmented by other things coming along the margins. In 1959, Hawaii became a state. And the uh, business and investment mood in some parts of the Hawaiian business community shifted considerably at that time. Hawaii became to be perceived as, a very, as an increasingly safe and secure place for investments in real estate and other things. Developers in Honolulu, and some came in from Denver, decided to go into the lava fields and buy up vast tracts of land, tens of thousands of acres. They then proceeded to subdivide it to uh, occasionally bring in dozers and heavy equipment and uh, bring in road systems, develop road systems, and then market it. The marketing was done worldwide, but with a big emphasis in places like the mainland of the United States and Australia. Uh, initially, thing, not much happened, but eventually people began to buy their three or four acre lots in Hawaii. Uh, not much building occurred originally, but eventually building began to occur. And so now we see, now there's 15 named subdivisions in the lower east rift zone of Kilauea. Here are a few of them, Eden Rock Estates, so-called fern acres yet larger lots, Hawaiian acres, the Ainaloa development, the ancient or the old town of Pahoa dating from sugarcane days, uh, Hawaiian shores and Hawaiian beaches, Nanawaili estates, Leilani estates, which figured quite prominently in last year's eruptions, uh, the Kalapana Seaview estates, Black Sand subdivision, we talked about Royal Gardens over here and so forth. So these are just uh, a sampling of, of most of the larger subdivisions that were occurring in that area. On June 27th of 2014, to do a little more kind of semi-ancient history, a lava flow erupted in an odd direction here. It, instead of moving along the rift or down to the south, it decided to go to the northeast. Uh, the high topography axis of the rift is along this direction, so if you erupt on axis, you're either going to go to the southeast or the northwest. 
or the Northeast. So it moved in this direction, dropped into a crack for a while, reappeared, and then ultimately uh, wound up on the southwestern uh, portion of the, the old town of Pahoa, uh, scaring everyone and making several merchants evacuate their merchandise, only to bring it back a few months later and so forth. Here's a uh, kind of a physiographic, in a sense, look at things. This is the high axis of the East Rift Zone. Pu'o'o'o is here, Royal Gardens here, and we've talked about all these subdivisions, or most of them already. Uh, the Geological Survey, in, in conjunction with the Civil Defense uh, Agency of the Big Island of Hawaii, have developed a lava hazard zone map, which runs from number one to number, number nine. Uh, number one is the most dangerous and the most volcanically active zone, and that's this bright orange here. The hatchard zone is lava zone number two. But because this is the topographic high, and these are somewhat over the hill to the northwest and over the hill to the southeast, lava, lava flows erupting along the axis have a, a nasty habit of moving into lower elevation zones. So building in these areas is not a guarantee, really, of anything. It's perhaps a slight deferment of things. This is a somewhat dated, at this point, map of the subdivisions in the lower Puna area and the Kilauea summit area. There's 15 of them named, as I mentioned. There's something like 122,000 people living in this area now. At the time, some of them had as many as 4,200 people living in them. Uh, and you can see that um, this becomes quite a problematic area to build your house in or to do farming or just to own a lot with nothing on it. The lava flows began to break out along a line of fissures here. There were 22 individual eruptive fissures uh, at the full extent of it. They're discontinuous along strike because they're on echelon arranged in structural geology terms. But nevertheless, all these fractures rotate subtly as they move down in the Earth's crust and link up with a master fracture at relatively shallow depth, a couple kilometers or so, brings you into the master controlling fracture, which is, runs continuously along strike. Fissure 8 that figured quite prominently in all this is in this area here in Leilani Estates. But the other thing to note on this slide is the, uh, the distribution of older flows. Here's an older flow or series of flows from 1840, ultimately going into the ocean. Here's one, uh, a series of flows from 1955, also reaching the ocean. And then in February of 1960, there was a, a major flow here, which also reached the ocean. So that even by the time 1959 and statehood rolled around, everyone knew that there had been recent activities in this area. It was not a secret by any stretch. Now, also on this plot are a series of blue lines that look like river valleys. So they're not river valleys, they're all dry, but they're calculated paths of steepest descent done by the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory using digitized maps uh, in which they would, they would set this network of steepest descent paths up to give some guidance to civil defense authorities about where the likely trajectory of flows feeding them at higher levels might wind up. So you can see that all these guys here would be going down to Kalapana, Seaview Estates and so forth. Uh, these to Pohoiki and so on. Uh, there is a, an active geothermal plant in the middle of the Lower East Rift Zone. It's called the PGV or Puna Geothermal Ventures. It's owned by Ormat Technologies, an Israeli company. They have operations worldwide in Africa, in the southwestern part of the US, in California and Nevada and in Europe and elsewhere. And they've had this operation for about 30 years or so. This is a 38 megawatt power plant. 
with permissions uh, to drill additional drill holes and take it to 45 megawatts. Their early decision was to go high and hot. Hot because they're along the axis of the rift zone, so the uh, magmatically induced heat and the magmatically driven hydrothermal system is all along this axis. Groundwater coming in from Mauna Loa in this direction, feeding this hydrothermal system. And high because they wanted to be topographically high just in case something happened. And they were very, very lucky last year. Something, of course, did happen. They had a little bit of damage. They had two or three well pads that were covered. They prepped everything beforehand. They plugged them with concrete, uh, protected them with surface ash and so forth and barriers. But now since they have the GPS coordinates of all the wellheads, they can expeditiously return to them, scrape them off, reoccupy them, redrill them, probably relog them, and then be back in business. There's another thing I wanted to say here, and that is uh, we can see from this dashed line from thermal IR imaging, airborne thermal IR imaging, the locus of the lava tube that fed these various flows. And you can see it occasionally bifurcates and then recombines and immediately bifurcates again and so on. And basically here it's hooking around to the east and southeast, uh, making a run around Kapoho Crater here. Uh, so that's one aspect of this slide that's worth looking at. Another is the new coastline and the new land that was formed, about 850 acres, which now becomes the property of the state of Hawaii, formed out of new lava last year. And that's everything to the east of this dashed line. And then the last thing to be looked at is the relative volumes and flow rates of the older flows compared to the new stuff. The older flows have flow rates which are something like two to five times, uh, I, I'm sorry, a half, a half to a fifth or so uh, of the current flow rate, the 19, uh, 2018 flow rate. And this is something like uh, five to eight times the volume of the 1840, the 1960, or the 1955 flows. The volume of this stuff collectively is on the order of 450 million cubic meters. The flow rates are in the, are in the range 15 uh, million cubic meters to 25 million cubic meters per second. Now that works out to be about 15 to 25, I said, I, I meant 150 to 250. That works out to be 15 to 25 concrete mixers full of lava each second. So that's a, a, a phenomenal output. Anyway, you can see that uh, my laptop did a little stuttering, but in the process you can see the time evolution of some of these segments there. Uh, this is expansion from July 10th to the 11th, and uh, May 3rd to the uh, 9th of July. Here is more material being added to the coastline and more development of the lava tube. Some thermal IR work has been done, as I mentioned, to uh, track the locus of these lava tubes. Here we can see that old bifurcation and recombination and rebifurcation and so forth. Uh, in July of last year, there was a major blowout in the corner. And we think this was due to centrifugal force, that lavas moving rapidly through the tube and around a tight corner encountered a weakened edge in the northeast blew it out and then formed a subsequent uh, triple lobe of, of la new lava pads over here. Uh, I think that we've talked about most of this stuff before. I don't have too much to add to this particular slide. However, uh, I would remind you that there's some, some 22 of these individual segments, not all of them plotted here, with the somewhat uh, remarkable Fissure 8, which invaded Leilani Estates and produced great destruction in this particular part. 
and in fact is responsible for almost all this activity, with the exception of 17, 18, 16, 20, 22, and so on. This was the last vent to open. This is in Leilani Estates about the 6th or so of May of last year. Um, the palm tree heights in this location are on the order of 40 to 50 feet. And so we can see uh, plume activity from one, two, three significant vents in this particular view with uh, eruptive material going up to about twice the plume, twice the palm tree height. One way of tracking underground the progress and the location of the conduit system is to first recognize that we're looking to the west-northwest. The summit of Kilauea is up here. This is above the magma reservoir. The upper east rift zone bends like this, and then it, and then it begins to actually move around and bend and inflect ever so slightly to the east-northeast. But you can see in these many plumes of water vapor, the trace of the migrating magma at depth. It's flashing the groundwater to steam ultimately and then condensing to water vapor just above the vent. You can see what the distribution looks like and alas, here we are over the notorious Fissure 8 location, vigorously erupting, sending its flows off towards the ocean here. Here's the coastline. Sometimes the flows will develop what's called a skylight. This is a collapse of the roof, so you could actually look down into the active lava tube. Some people have actually climbed out on top of these things and sampled them. I don't recommend it. Uh, and sometimes the lava flow, a portion of the lava flow will rupture and uh, produce an outpouring of lava on the surface. So you can see this kind of thing going on here. Here, this one is more or less tracking the same topography. They flow around islands. These are called kipukas in Hawaiian and so forth. And ultimately, everything goes down to the ocean. This is a street in Leilani Estates on the about the middle of May. This is an, uh, referred to as an a'a flow. There are two kinds of, of lava flows that each have a unique Hawaiian name. One of them is called a'a because it very much resembles what you're, what you're saying when you're trying to walk over this stuff. It's, it's treacherous clinkers that everything seems to be moving under your feet at the same time. And you don't want to fall on it because it's very glassy shards on the outside of all these clinkers is basically volcanic glass. So you can get very well lacerated if you take a tumble. Well, needless to say, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near it if it's, if it's active like this. But here it's, it's uh, been here long enough, it's advancing down the street towards us. It's igniting some of the low-hanging phone wires and ultimately the electric lines if it gains a little bit of elevation. Some of the trees in the background are on fire. The second kind of lava flow is called pohoihoi, and that's a smooth, ropey, textured lava flow. It's very easy to walk on. Uh, it looks very much like you came into the room and kicked up the rug because it's, it's uh, sinusoidal in cross-section, and that's why they call it ropey lava flow. The differential movement of the lava just beneath the skin of the lava flow drags the folds closer together and wraps them around things and so forth. This is that same street um, towards the middle of the month of June. And here things have reached a height of 55 meters or so. The lava is erupting from this location and moving off to the left. Um, tourists, visitors, and residents have been walking down the street to check things out. As of the 1st of August, there was a for sale sign that appeared here. So play your cards right and something good might happen. Um, this is a policeman. You can see the blue light on top. He's there to kind of supervise and keep order and make sure nothing bad happens. But that's the story. That's the scene at, at Leilani Estates in June of last year. Now, uh, because you've got all this heat source on the surface and the near surface in the immediate subsurface, 
And because there's a lot of vegetation, there's a great amount of tree growth here. We're talking about rainfalls that vary between 150 inches a year and 400 inches a year. It's, so parts of this are a virtual jungle. Lots of trees. You have lots of tree roots. This is actually a street, an asphalt street, that occasionally has cracks in it. The tree roots are being coked, that is, they're being carbonized, and they're releasing their methane in the process. The methane is occasionally leaking through these cracks in the street and igniting. So you can see these kind of pretty blue burning flames in the process. This is the PGV plant on a foggy morning. Uh, what you can't see here are lava flows that have crept in, and you, can, you maybe can see this one, that have crept into close proximity. As I said, they did get three or four wellheads covered. They, of course, had to shut the whole plant down for many, many months before they could reopen again. They're now reopened. They had to bulldoze roads in over the new lava flows and do a whole lot of other things. You can see the piping distribution on the surface, heat exchangers, uh, buildings for maintenance and equipment and generators and so forth. This is, the, uh, this is one of many, many, many community meetings that occurred. Uh, as I said, there's thousands and thousands of people living in these areas, under the gun, so to speak. Uh, they became very concerned about their properties, some of which by this time had disappeared. Others were inaccessible because they were cut off from access by uh, blocked roads. And so they, in this particular evening, about 7 o'clock, they came together in the Pahoa High School cafeteria to meet with the Civil Defense Coordinator and the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory staff and get, get their reading on what the near future had in store for them. Uh, sometimes the meetings become uh, emotional and there's always a police presence to make sure nothing gets out of, out of hand. This is a man named Tolmij Magno. He's the Island of Hawaii Civil Defense Coordinator and he was very good at giving virtually daily updates on the radio and television about what things were happening now, what we might expect tomorrow, and so forth. But typically there would be Hawaiian Volcano Observatory staffers, nothing, no one here at this particular time, but they would be briefing the audience, people would stand up for Q&As and so forth. These things would go on for, oh, two or three hours sometimes, start at seven and break up around 10. This is Clifford Clinton. He was sitting on his front porch in Leilani Estates. We call them Lanai's, but they're actually front porches with a roof over them. Having morning coffee about nine o'clock uh, on I think the 26th or so of June, when a, <coughs> a one foot diameter volcanic bomb came through the roof and badly injured his leg. <coughs> He's recovering in Hilo Hospital but this is kind of, uh, in a sense, the face of volcanic risk uh, in living around active Hawaiian volcanoes. This is the inside of a Red Cross facility set up in the uh, uh, community center in the immediate area. Uh, this was a nice, dry, secure location in which people could pitch a, a small tent, have some privacy while they were f trying to figure out what to do about their home, which may or may not still be standing, and access, and all those other things. There were hundreds and hundreds, indeed thousands, of displaced people. A bit later on, local merchants contributed building materials and manpower, local contractors contributed manpower, and began setting up small temporary shelters in the Pahoa area. And here's about nine or so of them under construction or, or immediately finished, uh, getting ready to welcome displaced people in. This, of course, is older, older buildings in town. Uh, this is a very busy area for agriculture. 40% uh, of the state's entire papaya crop is grown in this particular area. So Honolulu, for example, depends on Lower Puna for much of its papaya and other things. There's also exotic agriculture growing on. This, is a, this was a orchid greenhouse, which was quite extensive. It went on and on over here. 
um, a very expensive investment. The flow front, as you can see, this is in the Kapoho area, is advancing along here. It's advancing down towards the bottom of the screen. This greenhouse complex disappeared about 20 minutes after this slide was taken. This is a shot that's courtesy of Mick Calber and Tropical Visions video and Paradise Helicopters. It shows you the Kapoho Beaches area that's being invaded by fl a flow front that's coming in like this. It's consuming a house here. It's approaching the rear of this house. The flow front kind of extends like this and goes on around over here. When um, all, virtually all 60 of these so-called collapse explosion events occurred at the summit, it was very much like taking a cylinder of rock that's two or three kilometers in diameter and banging it down on top of the CO2 charged upper levels of the magma reservoir. That had the effect of setting off a cascade of CO2 bubble uh, explosions, micro explosions, which collectively in aggregate led to a larger explosion, which tended to lift these blocks up in the air several centimeters sometimes and produce the uh, produce the eruptive plume that we saw in the first couple of slides over the cold era. Now every time the blocks came down, they did a couple of other things too. They, they punched down on this fluid column in the reservoir, which was then of course connected to the rift zones laterally, and it had the effect of delivering a, you know, chemists talk about an aqua lot, we can think of a magma lot as maybe a conceptual equivalent, another parcel, another bundle of fluid superposed on the ambient flow into the East Rift Zone. So you had a surge, basically, riding the crest, so to speak, of the flow that was already going on in the East Rift Zone. And we can see in map view four of these surges from this particular slide. Here's one that has an outline that looks kind of like this, an early one. Then there's a subsequent surge here, a third one here that's still incandescent along the edges, and a new one here that's extremely incandescent and just overflowing figure, or fissure eight. <clears throat> now you can see how the agricultural lands in Lower Puna were divided and re-subdivided by moving lava flows, all of them moving from the vent area across the landscape towards the ocean. So here's one that cut off all these farms. Here's yet another one that cut off these farms. Another one here, and then the fissure eight activity here, which flows around islands, again referred to as kipukas in Hawaiian, recombine, uh, come down, flow around yet higher standing topography and so forth. This is Kapoho cone for reference. It's an old cone, prehistoric. And here are some of these ag lands which are developed into uh, small farms. You can see the subdivision of the fields and so forth. And a few houses still remaining, like this one, for example. Well, now uh, the eruption after 95 days cut off. It ran from May 3rd, basically, to August 5th, 95 days, and it's over. This was taken about the, the middle of August. These are lava tubes that are still draining. So we have flow going down a topographic slope. The valve up here has been cut off, but everything is still moving down through lava tubes. It's like painting the wall. And after you corked up the can and put away your brushes, there's still stuff running down the wall. So now we can see these, these lava tubes draining into the ocean surf, ocean surf along here. This is the coastline. Now we're out over the ocean. Here's a large kind of almost a flow development still draining away. And here's a tighter shot showing you the vigor of the surf and uh, the elements of, this is kind of anticipates the next couple of slides, hydrothermal explosions. 
and a draining lava tube. On July 16th, um, a tour company based in Hilo, which has two large aluminum craft powered by very powerful Honda outboard engines and can host 75 people on board, left Hilo Harbor at 3 o'clock in the morning, bound for the site. And they were, there was a full complement of passengers on board. <clears throat> the vessel that this photograph was taken from, you can see a couple of passengers just at the edge here, was called the Hot Spot. Um, they were given permission from the Coast Guard to approach this explosive activity, this mixing of seawater and lava at very close range, about 150 yards I think was the guideline, which is substantially less than the safe, safe limits that had been set up earlier. They did a special plea kind of thing in a written request to the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard says, sure. Anyway, they approached at close range. They're in the process now of beating a hasty retreat because they had an unpleasant experience this is the hot spot after it had docked in Hilo with about a two foot hole blown in the roof by a lava bomb that came down through the boat and impacted this complement of 75 people or so who were riding out there. Um, there were 22 people who were seriously injured and needed treatment. There was one young woman who, from Illinois who was extremely uh, badly injured. She spent weeks and weeks in the hospital in Honolulu she probably saved the boat because had she not been between the, the heel, the keel of the boat and the lava bomb, it would have probably gone through the bottom of the boat and, and you'd, you'd be dealing with mass fatalities out at sea. But be that as it may, this is another element of volcanic risk. For reference, this is the shoreline of Hilo. Our house is over here. Uh, and this gives you some idea of small sailboats and other watercraft that are, that are uh, typically moored there. Now let's go back to the southeast coastline of the island. Uh, we're going to dial back in time to uh, late June. And here we see uh, Kapoho Bay, which is quite scenic, was quite scenic, uh, with lots of vacation developments around it. These were, uh, many of these were quite high-end vacation rentals that would accommodate two, three, or four groups simultaneously through Airbnb and other online booking sites like that. Uh, anyway, the lava flow is advancing towards us. Uh, it's moving towards this part of the coastline and so forth. Ultimately, Kapoho Bay was more or less completely filled and everything we're looking at here was obliterated. 716 houses and structures disappeared under this lava flow last year. Uh, these are, this is another view of some of these uh, uh, often quite large vacation rentals. Here you can see the flow front has actually come in from this direction, wrapped around and is beginning to approach from the southwest. Something's burning here. This house is now on fire uh, and it would later uh, link up with this stuff over here and everything disappeared. This is uh, Kapoho Beaches uh, subdivision. Uh, the flow has come in here. You can see the roof, the remnants of roofs, corrugated iron roofs, steel roofs of houses that have already been consumed. It's moving on this, these structures with using lobes to get there. It's wrapping around it wrapped around this structure, which I think was all concrete or cinder block, moved up to the rear and consumed this house. This is one of the patterns of, of how your house is destroyed in a Hawaiian lava flow. The flow moves up towards the house. It does not need to touch the house. It can come within a few meters. The radiant energy will catch the siding on fire. It's all gone. So once the wood and the siding and, and studs and the internal contents have burned, the corrugated steel roof simply settles down on the remains and basically as a kind of a marker of what used to be there. This guy here so far is lucky. That won't last long. Everything we see in the picture disappeared. Now, um, 
this is this is Kilauea, and basically, if we if we have two conceptual bubbles, geez, my talk hasn't started for nine minutes. If we, <laughs> I've got a lot of time. If we have two conceptual bubbles, and we fill one bubble with volcanic risk, volcanic hazards, I should say. We're going to have eruptions. We're going to have lahars. We're going to have gas emission events. We're going to have major earthquakes. We're going to have phreatic eruptions. And then we have another bubble, which is filled with culture. We're going to have people, highways, houses, farms, dwellings, schools, electrical distribution systems, phone lines, broadcasting towers, geothermal plants, and you name it. Community centers, hospitals, shopping centers, whatever. As long as we keep these two conceptual bubbles apart, everything's fine. The problem is, is when we bring them together and they start to touch. And the, you can make the problem worse by, making one by forcing one bubble to lie down on top of the other. And that's the ultimate problem, which is what we've had here for the last 60 years. Now, Mauna Loa, uh, is another Hawaiian volcano active, very much larger. It's, the, it's, the, it's Earth's largest active volcano, volumetrically. It's over 14,000 feet tall. It last erupted in March of 1984. It's now 35 years out. It usually erupts every six years. So we're way, way overdue for an eruption. And it's been continuous, well, it's been discontinuously inflating over the years. Uh, since 2013, the Southwest Rift Zone has been swelling, which is probably going to be the location of the next Mauna Loa eruption. There are five named subdivisions on the Southwest Rift Zone of Mauna Loa. One of them is Hawaiian Ocean View Estates, which is enormous, 11,000 acres rising up to 5,000 feet elevation. With, with sometimes one lane Jeep tracks, which are four wheel drive, it's hard to get in and out sometimes. And Mauna Loa uh, has a record of erupting volumes of magma or lava, which are literally orders of magnitude larger than Kilauea's. At, at flow rates that are phenomenally higher and at transit speeds across the earth, which will take it from the upper southwest rift zone to the ocean coast in as little as three hours. So if you're up sleeping at three in the morning in Hawaiian Ocean View Estates, and you have an eruption in your backyard, you better keep your suitcase packed and your car engine running because you, the chances of you getting out safely are, are I think, diminished. Tenuous. This is what's happening geodetically and seismically across Mauna Loa's summit. You can see an acceleration of earthquake rate of occurrence per week, zero to 120. A big uptick in tw late 2013, rising into 2015. There's a, there's a couple of geodetic stations, Mauna Loa South Pit and MOKP here which are periodically revisited and line length measurements are made across them station to station. This is a record of those line length increases. It tends to mimic the uptick in seismicity in the 2014 to 20, early 2016 time period. Here's uh, what the landscape looks like. It's exceedingly lunar. There's nothing living up there. No plants, no animals. Occasionally a fly from low elevations gets trapped in a thermal and goes by, but probably not for long. This is Mauna Kea, our astronomy center over here with 13 active observatories. Uh, the caldera is enormous. It's enormous. You can't, there's really no sense of scale here, uh, but I can tell you it's on the order of four miles at least in width and about 10 to 12 miles in length. This is the 1940 cone. It straddles the the, the, the fissure, the eruptive fissure, which typically runs across the caldera floor and enters the southwest rift zone here. Here you can see lavas from recent eruptions that is prior to 1984 that have moved off 
in these two directions. And here is a yet another view of, of that southwest rift zone from somewhat lower elevation. Ochre patterns indicate a lot of oxidation and relatively young flows are shown in deep charcoal. Uh, who did all this uh, to themselves? Uh, as I mentioned, 1959 was the starting point for subdivision development. Developers were key. The state of Hawaii was very happy to approve all of these development plans in the early years, and they kept doing that until at least the mid to late 1970s when they stopped. Uh, of course, the people who had purchased properties were another key element. They, they were accepting the risk. The real estate industry was happy to help. The county of Hawaii would issue progressively building permits to those who wanted to apply for building permits. If they did apply, their property would then be added to the county tax rules. In about 1990, Pu'u Olavas by then had been inundating the southern flank of the volcano Kilauea for seven years. They'd totally wiped out 125 houses in Royal Garden subdivision. They'd wiped out the ancient Hawaiian fishing community at Kalapana. The insurers in the area said, whoa, whoa, I think we've seen enough. I don't think we're going to write policies in this area anymore. The state of Hawaii said, hold it, not so fast. We're going to create a new entity called the Hawaii Property Insurance Association, HPIA. And if you want to sell insurance policies anywhere in the state on any island, you will continue to insure people in these at-risk volcanically active zones like we've been looking at. At which point, many people concluded that, hey, what have we got to lose? The subtitle of my talk, a new building boom was on. And that's when all these high-end vacation rentals got built after 1990 that have disappeared last year. Uh, and finally, and finally, a recent player, a recent partner in all this has been everyone in the room that pays federal taxes. Because of course, the county of Hawaii had approached the US government for road building assistance because the displaced people were now screaming to have the roads restored, open back up again so they could get to their lot or their house that's still standing or their now inundated property. $250 million was the tab so far from the federal government. The county of Hawaii has lost $300 million when property tax receipts began a wholesale collapse that was virtually synchronous with the lava flow inundations. Once your property is burned up, you somehow lose the appetite to keep paying property taxes. A lot of folks have helped, in particular the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and Tina Neal, scientist in charge at the observatory. She's been super, but so have a lot of other groups and people. E the last day or two of August of last year, I wrote a piece for an online journal called Honolulu Civil Beat, in which I tried to propose a solution for all this. Uh, and the article was basically entitled Envision and Expanded Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And the, the gist of it was, I think my golden coach is getting just about ready to turn into a pumpkin. Um, the gist of it was, uh, let's expand the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park to the, to the, shall we say, the volcanic natural limits of things. So we'll go into these areas. We will basically approach the property owners. We'll say, let's go back to May 1st before anything happened. Let's get a reckoning on your property values on May 1st and let's get you made whole again by paying you off. Well, some won't want to agree to that. They'll, they're wedded to the land. And so we'll say, fine. The National Park System since 1930 has had a program called scenic easements. Uh, and in the scenic easements or pastoral easements, you're basically grandfathered in 
You can continue to own and use your property. Indeed, you can hand it down to your sons and daughters. You can continue to farm. You can continue to live in it. Uh, but you can't build anything else. You can't put on another garage and so forth. Uh, and then eventually you and your heirs will get tired of it and we will, we will buy it back from the last heir kind of thing. Well, in 1916, when the National Park System was created, there were very few landowners. They were enormous sugar plantation operators or, or, or landed estates tied to royal families, like the Bishop Estate and so forth. So there were, in Mauna Loa and Kilauea, there were maybe only two or three major property owners. They were easily approached with the proposal for the new park. Thomas Jagger, the founder of HBO, and Lauren Thurston, a Honolulu businessman, would occasionally sail off to Washington, D.C., take the train from San Francisco, talk to Congress. They finally talked them into it. In 1916, the park was created. But they didn't go far enough. I acknowledged in the article that this thing doesn't have a snowball's chance, that there's going to be bitter resistance every inch of the way with vested property owners, politicians who like this kind of tax revenue, and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's an idea. Anyway, um, we're just about ready to wrap and do a Q&A to the extent people want to hang around. Here are some projects that graduate students might want to chew on for a thesis. We need to know this thing is going to be written about for decades probably as a case study in unique Hawaiian activity. But to understand how it happened, we need to work on problems like these and others. And that's it. Thank you very much. I knew there was a danger in doing this this late on a Friday afternoon. It's TGIF and people are thinking about going home and hitting the highways and escaping the beltway traffic. Yes. Has anybody done an analysis of how much the state uh, is benefiting from all of these developments and collecting in property tax versus how much they're losing? Well, well the, the, the state of Hawaii gains because <clears throat> the large agribusiness developments like the orchid greenhouse I showed you, and they, there are many, many other orchid greenhouses, or the B&Bs, the, the large multifamily Airbnb type vacation quarters, they pay something called general excise tax, GET. And that's usually a percentage, like four to seven percent of their gross revenues to the state of Hawaii directly, the Department of Taxation. So that's one source of income for the state. The county, of course, makes money because uh, there are visitors coming into the county through Hilo Airport. They're spending money in restaurants downtown and, and so car rentals and, and you name it. It's a level of economic activity that's most appreciated. So there's a lot of contributors to this state income. Um, now, of course, the county has lost uh, vast amounts of tax revenue, and they're eager to somehow get it back again. It's, I think if you're a county administrator, it's, it's a good drug that you've kind of been mainlining for many years, and when it's taken away, it's the end of the world. But, um, yeah, so they've, they've, they want to restore the income from the residents and so forth. Um, and everyone shops in local grocery stores. All the occupants of these houses would go to the Safeway or the Long's Drug Store or go buy tires at the local Firestone shop. I mean, it's the, it's the usual stuff. So all that income has been taken away. And uh, the State of Hawaii Visitors Bureau, uh, as you fly in on your United, your United flight, the hostess will come down the aisle with a 12-inch with a by 4-inch sheet that you, you circle the numbers and fill in your name and phone number and how many nights will you be staying and where and will it be a residence, will it be a hotel? And the Hawaii Visitors Bureau wants to know everything about you. So every time you come in, they wanna know everything about you. So all of these, and tourism in Hawaii is the main driver of the economy. 
Um, it used to be sugarcane and pineapple. Ultimately, marijuana cultivation was larger than both sugarcane and pineapple combined. But all of that was kind of under the cover. Uh, but, uh, and all of that was not taxed. So the state of Hawaii didn't get any benefit from that. Well, they've, they've, <laughs> they've discovered the wonders of medical marijuana. And so there's medical marijuana clinics that are popping up seemingly everywhere. Yeah, so it's just a matter of time. Yeah. So going on a more like physical volcanology side, do we have any idea why the eruption rates and the laser flow velocity on Managua is so much larger than Kilauea? Well, the volume of the magma reservoir is proportionally much larger than Kilauea's. It scales with the size of the mountain generally, and the mountain is like an order of magnitude larger volumetrically or more than Kilauea. And a really, it occupies 60%, its footprint is 60% of the entire island. So I think it's simply a scaling effect of a much larger system, a much larger storage reservoir. And when that reservoir ruptures, there's more fluid available to flood the landscape. I think it's as simple as that. The viscosity of the melt is almost identical for all important purposes. The uh, dilation and the, and the size of the conduits may be significantly different, and I'd expect them to be on Mauna Loa vis-a-vis -vis Kilauea. So larger putative dikes and, and more volume flowing through those conduits. 